Once again, my name is Anna, and here I am passing the floor over to our fantastic presenter, Mr. Michael. Thank, Thank you, you for kind, joining Anna. us. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? Um, today, we're going to be going through reflections, more specifically on water. Um, the principle of reflections can apply to pretty much anything, but uh, water seems to be most complicated for people, um, especially when you're painting it in life on location, because it's really hard to see. Um, so here, these are kind of a uh, selection of stuff that I've done. Uh, top right is uh, Pitt Meadows. Below that is Salt Spring Island, for anybody who's over there. There's, I found two places in Salt Spring Island you can paint. <laughs> um, in the middle top, that's in Port Coquitlam. The one beside that, that's actually Ontario. That's a beautiful little just pond in a conservation area. And the bottom left is in Poco as well. And it's, a, it's an amazing location in, in fall and spring. It's great. As you get to this time of year, um, it's getting worse because just everything turns green and monotonous. Um, it's not that I don't like painting greens. It's just that it's too, it's too much of one color, right? Painting impactful reflections. Uh, a lot of it also reside or relies on the fundamentals of painting anything really. And uh, my mantra really is correct shapes and the correct values and your correct color temperatures, add a little bit of variation in your brush strokes and add some variation to your edges and you got a good painting. Um, seems pretty simple, right? So to demonstrate that, uh, hop over to here. And so let me just bring that up. This is one of the, the bottom left hand scenes of that painting that's in Poco, but with the water all semi-drained out and a little bit of green. And you could take this, take a photo like this and take it to your studio, or if you're working um, on location, you could come up to this and you think, well, what am I going to paint? How am I going to paint it? And it all comes down to, well, composition as well. So another, if you're on location, a good thing to do is just take your phone and, you know, take a picture. So that isolates, isolates it already, and it makes it a lot easier to sketch onto your canvas. So for example, you know, you know, this position where the bush meets the edge here is a third down or third up. And this is a third down. You can put two marks there and then you can start sketching. And so it, it gives you an avenue to help you start sketching the scene onto your canvas. Now, let's say you just have this photograph and you get to work on it in your studio. And it's kind of a hot mess with all the grasses and the sticks and the mud and the, and the, and the water. A good thing to do is just print it out. Well, print out a couple extra copies and you can take a Sharpie to it. Now I just use red to emphasize it because it stands out more than black. But you can start just outlining the shapes of the darks, outline the shapes of the water reflection, and outline the shapes of the darks over here, outline the shapes of the, the mud. And this is what I'm talking about in terms of shape. So you have a, a shape of the mud here and this value. So you just put it in that dark. You know, this seems to be a little bit darker, put it in that dark. And you kind of build it up like a puzzle piece. And as you go through it, uh, as you as you progress throughout, it just builds up itself. And this particular scene with the green top grass and everything else, yellow is one that I painted a couple weeks ago. And this ended up to be the final piece. Um, and it's a little bit different than the photo, primarily because I did it on site. And I just put embellishments where I thought they needed to be. The focal point, of course, being the grasses and the reflections. So let's go back to here and talk about the fundamentals of reflections. And these are kind of guidelines. You don't have to adhere to them. They don't really, sometimes they don't apply when you're looking at photos, especially the first one. You know, when you have darker values above the water, they generally reflect lighter. But I find when you're doing photography, those reflections can actually look darker. So take it with a grain of salt, do, do with it what you want. Values usually reflect darker. So if you have a bright white, it'll be more of a gray. And I'll show you some examples of that pretty soon. Edges and reflections are softer, generally. Sometimes you get those quintessential scenes where you know there's a you know there's a mountain in the background and there's a lake in the foreground, which is like glass smooth and it's amazing reflection. It's almost perfect. And, and you know, they're great to experience in person, they're great to experience in a large photograph. But I find in a a translation and it's just more confusing than anything else that's my opinion uh colors that are reflected are generally less chromatic which means less saturated 
And um, I find when doing reflections, hinting at things is better than being exact. And I'll show you why in, in a little bit, but note my little caveat down below here, all the above can be ignored for the sake of the painting. So let's say you want to accentuate a color in the, in the, in the water. You know, make a value darker, make a value lighter to create some more contrast. It all really depends what your focus point on the painting is. So this is a photograph of a scene I took the other day and it's it was quite dark. And um, when you're painting plain air or on location, what's beautiful about it is you can go there on a very cloudy situation, but you really like the scene and you can see that the clouds are moving. And you know, in about 15, 20 minutes, you might get some a nice, uh, nice chunk of light coming through. So you can start the painting. And then as that light transitions through, you start seeing things that you'd never see otherwise. And you capture them in the moment and your painting benefits from that. So let's say, for example, this is the scene you walk up to and you really like the composition, small trees and big trees. You start to see some reflections. And of course, you can see all the reflection of the water as well. But you know, you wait 10 minutes and all of a sudden uh, the water starts popping out and you can really see some beautiful greens over here. You can, you can see the contrast between these three. And it, it, to me, that takes the focal point away from this main tree. Well, interesting, and it helps guide you in. You know, this this to me was really interesting. So I ended up painting this, and this is the result. So this tree is the main subject. However, for me, this is the focal point because it has a higher contrast and the most chroma in the situation. So although generally reflections are less chromatic, well, who cares? Because I wanted to make a point here, and so I made them more chromatic, and I made the contrast to this point. So everything I talk about, think about it and be aware of it, but don't necessarily always have to apply it that way, right? Seeing reflections is really about observation. And so when you do just rely on one photograph, what you miss is the water lapping up onto the shore. You miss uh, the different wave pattern when the wind comes across. Um, you, you miss all these things that that photo will never ever show you unless you take a photo every five minutes for three hours. And your scene becomes more static. Whereas if you're on location, you can see it, see it happen. You think, oh, I, that would really help add that element to help, you know, maybe there's a wind that came across and made this ripply so I could add a nice violet in here. Maybe that would help the scene. Um, and so observation is the key. And so we'll go through a series of photographs here. This is just a simple boat on a glass, flat piece of water. This guy's reflecting, all this other stuff's reflecting, which is really nice. Uh, the point here is the uh, bright of the boat, right? The reflection is uh, quite darker. Same with the shadow side, reflection is quite darker. Um, you could argue whether it's more chromatic or not down below. You might want to kill that and up it here. Uh, now this is a boat on Ripley water. Uh, again, though, you can see that the, uh, the value here on the boat is a lot darker in the reflection. What makes this reflection so cool is the shadow of these, I don't know what they're called, stiffening boards on the boat. You can see how the shadow is actually rippling in the water. So that makes the water quite interesting. And let's say you're on location here and you're trying to paint this. You're looking at that reflection and you just can't keep up with it. Well, pull out your phone, take a photo and use that as a reference to create the reflections. It's still painted outside. You're just helping it, helping yourself out by um, freezing the scene more or less. Now, this is an interesting uh, photograph. I didn't take any of these except for the first two. This is somewhere in the world. Uh, but what I love about it is it has the sandbar in the the middle of the lake and it changes quite considerably with the reflections on it so there's a big reflection of this mountain on this side comes across and pretty much puts it all in shadow i assume this is a little bit deeper part of the uh, sandbar um, but you can see how it changes the value here and you, you skip over here these trees actually darken up quite a bit but this distant mountain when it reflexes reflects when it has a reflection on the water it lightens the sandbar so you can see there's quite a bit of difference between those. Although it's the same sand at the bottom of the lake, it changes depending on the reflection. So just look at the values, observe what's going on and, and paint it in that right shape. Now this is Monet's garden. I didn't take this one. This is um, the lily pads. Um, but what you notice about this reflection is it's quite vertical. Right? It, it's just, you can paint this with just a bunch of vertical brush strokes and be done with it as long as it's in the right value and there's enough variation between there's a little bit of yellow here, there's some darker greens, there's some lighter greens. Um, choosing a focal point for this painting, uh, you could kill this 
reflection here because this angle of incident is coming into the camera so it's a lot brighter you could adjust it so it's over here if you want you you could mute both of these reflections from the sky and accentuate this red bush in the back it really all depends but if you were to take this photograph and just paint it as is even if it was as good as a photo you'll find that your, your eye gets pulled down here quite a bit and it just makes for a um, adequate painting i guess you really need to tell the story of where you want people to view it this is crazy I think I'd have a breakdown if I had to paint this. Um, but what it tells you, and I, what I what I really want to show you is, if you zoom in and look at this reflection of this post, you really notice that it's on an angle, right? And you, you look up top and think, oh yeah, that post is kind of angling off to the side. And so the reflection can actually tell you a lot about what's above it. And usually I paint my reflections first, and then I paint what's above it, um, just because it tells me a lot about what's going on above before because we know what a tree looks like yeah it's vertical right the branches do this do that but when you look at the reflection it's not a tree anymore right and they go oh, where that's a weird shape that goes that way this and then it goes straight and then it kind of kicks to the right again and when you look at the scene you can't see this kicking to the right because it's above the funnel it's actually here um, but if you're to crop it right all this is information that you don't really see so it actually helps your observing the scene. It's just like painting something upside down, right? It helps your brain see things that you don't wouldn't necessarily see. Um, and this one's interesting because this is, a, again, a photograph. You can see how much darker this water is compared to the shadow inside the trees. Um, to me, I think it's just the way the photograph is done. But what, what's interesting about it, if you were to paint it like this, it actually grounds this photograph really nice. It could probably ground a painting really nice as well. You can see the greens are a lot darker and the shadow in here is a lot darker. And everything's just kind of hinted at with the, the observation point down below. It's just kind of a couple of strokes of paint. Now, this is crazy. Again, something I probably wouldn't want to paint. But what's beautiful about it is it, it tells you that, yes, for the main elements in a painting like this, you have to follow them along, right? This curves down just like the shape of this. So it's a reflection of it. But when you get into stuff like this, I mean, this, this is a crop photograph, so you can't really see anything above, above this fork here, right? So that tells me that from this point on, really, I can do whatever I want, right? So if you didn't see this, whoops. If you didn't see this fork in a reflection, you probably wouldn't even know there's a fork there. So really, you could shake this tree and just pull it down, pull another tree down, pull another tree down. And, as long as you take care of the mess that's going on back here that make it look like there's a mess of trees, you can pretty much do what you want in the reflection as long as you focus and get the correct reflection for the main trees, if that makes sense. What do you got here? And this one, with this one, because it's so beautiful. I think this is the end. Um, fall somewhere, but what's amazing about it is, you know, you get the main reflection down here, which is just crazy. A lot of blue from the uh, sky, but all the water here as well, reflecting all those oranges. And then there's some nice blues in here and then reflecting of orange again. It's it's quite a, quite phenomenal. So and I could the, probably sit at this location for like half an hour just observing all this. And we have a super cool comment or a question um, sure. asking whether you ever use black in your reflections. Um, no, I never have. I've used dark colors, um, but I've never used black. Black isn't even a color I have in my palette. I mix my own, but... Um, there's nothing wrong with it if you want to, for sure. Like if we go back to this photo, right? You could use black. The only thing about black is it's uh, it's a super cool color. Not that no, no, it's a fantastic color, but it's cold in temperature, right? So I would suggest for an instance like this, where you want some um, you want something to be alive, mix some burnt sienna in or some red into your black, uh, so you can keep that dark color, um, but you can bring it alive a bit more. Usually, if you put black, it kind of I find it it deadens the scene, especially when it's so vibrant like this. So just make sure you warm it up. That being said, if it's your artistic choice, then they get cool. And this is the scene we're going to paint today. This is down by uh, Coquitlam River here. And it's less crazy than the previous ones, but it has everything in it that we need in terms of um, you know, trees above. Interesting subject. These guys just happen to be standing here, which is a bonus. Um, sandbar. 
and the reflections themselves. But a couple of things we're going to do is I like these. You know, I generally paint on a rule of thirds because it's easy. I'm a lazy painter. Um, and they kind of line up on a rule of thirds, which is nice. I really love this kiss of light here. The, the Whoops, the background. But it's too central for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it over to the right and I'm going to bring it down in here. Um, but the eye, you know, it just, it just seems like it's splitting everything too much in half. So I'm going to bring it over. So there'll be two, two areas, not two areas of focus, but one subdued area and one main focus, depending on how bright we bring his shirt. And we might increase this guy's height. I'm not too sure. We'll see what it looks like when I paint it. Uh, that being said, if you were to want to make this guy bigger, right, you notice where their heads are, right? All you have to do is keep his head in the same position and make it a little bit bigger and then make his body bigger and make his legs bigger. Because that's pretty much where the eye level is. If you start moving him up, he's going to look gigantic, even if you're moving forward. So with that, any questions so far? Yes. Jill is wondering whether it would be possible for you to expand on using the rule of thirds in your paintings to get... Oh, sure. sure. Let me... So rule of thirds is generally you divide your canvas into... Oops, i got to get the right screen here. Oh, no, you can see that, right? Yes. Oh, there we go. So rule of thirds... Um, is when you divide your canvas into three different separate sections, horizontally and vertically. So um, actually, I'll go back to that one image if I can find it. There we go. So on your phone, you can have it gridded out for rule of thirds. So it just divides your canvas into three horizontal and three vertical grid lines uh, or sections. And the, the idea is uh, you pick one of these vertices or close to it to be your focal point. And you accentuate it like that. And or else you could have things that help guide you that focal point. So let's say in here, the focal point is this, this area up here for some reason. Um, in this focal, in, in this area here of the grid, I could always maybe put a stick going this way to help push your eye this direction to come over here to come up to the focal point, depending on how you want to handle it, right? So going back to this image, uh, same thing, if we can just imagine a grid going through here, these guys kind of fall just above, like this This tree tree line is about a quarter, so a third will be a little bit lower. So they kind of are in and around the rule of thirds. I generally like to push things closer to the edge of the canvas. I just like that tension a little bit more. And so that's what I'm going to do with the rule of thirds here is I'm just going to take them, I'm going to move them over a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but I won't bring them down to that cross point because it's not about being exactly where the lines cross, it's about giving a location for a focal point to be, mm -hmm. if that so helps. If you're, if you're taking a picture on your phone that you'd like to be set up for the composition to work from the photo later on, for example, if mm -hmm. you do place, because just people are asking in the chat, if you do place the, the focal point, so whether it's like people or like a very clear part of the reflection or like a very nice tree, if you put those on one of the areas where the lines cross in uh, the perimeter, that could be a really good starting point. So, you know, it's the rule of thirds, where those lines cross in those four corners, are those are all good options for putting your focal point, just depending on what you're going for. Well summarized. <laughs> and, and, and the rule of thirds will actually help your home photography as well. Like you're out in the park with your kids taking a photo, right? Instead of putting them in the center of the photo, like 99% of the population does, um, you know, focus on them, but then move your camera so they're in the lower right and uh, I don't know, the rest of the landscape is in the scene and it, it just makes for quite a difference in in uh, in the photo itself. But that's just my starting reference to, um, there's other things I do depending on the composition for how I want it, depending on my focal point, right? So this is going to be painted on an 8 by 13 board. And you might ask, well, why 8 by 13? It's such a weird number. Well, a while ago, I decided the goal and mean might be interesting to play with because um, I like long landscapes and or tall verticals like this, but I didn't like uh, say an eight by 16 or, or doubling that size, right? It just got too big. So with the eight by 13, it cuts uh, cuts three inches off, makes it a little more manageable. And I, I'm really liking the size. So that's why we're on an eight by 13 today. I'm in a, in a golden mean kick. I like golden means and squares. So I previously sketched this out on my, my board with just some vine charcoal, soft vine charcoal. I really like it because if you make a mistake, right, you can just easily erase it. It's not like some of the other hard charcoals that stain. And this bright pattern on the, on the right-hand side over here, that's my intention. This is just 
some trees and location the two figures will be over here and like i said before i'm going to start with the reflection that's a little bit too cool i'm, I'm a strong believer in, in color temperatures colors are kind of relevant because you know trees is green that's a little bit better let's get a little more pigment on here so feel free to ask questions throughout oh we have a question about what green are you using um one that i mixed i used ultramarine blue a little bit of hansi yellow and i threw in some uh, transparent orange which is made by gambling to warm it up okay um, awesome so to reiterate, that is ultramarine blue. That is, um, per, what, what was it? Permanent orange? Uh, transparent orange. Transparent orange. And finally, it was a, a yellow, eh? Yeah, handsome yellow medium. Awesome. Yeah. And I didn't warm up my green with a yellow because then I get more green. Whereas a reflection you can see is quite uh, more of a muted green. Mm -hmm. So that's and why did I chose you, the orange. Did you mix any of any like gamsol or any sort of solvent in there or medium? Yeah, to keep it a little bit thinner. Awesome. So gamsol? Yeah. Awesome. That's what I figured. <laughs> it gives that semi transparency as well. Now you might be wondering to yourself, people, well, what do you. What happens if you put it on too thin and leave it? Um, then you might be in a little bit of trouble. All right, so how do you prep your boards? Um, this is just a door skin, eighth inch mahogany plywood, and I throw on uh, two coats of uh, the gambling ground stuff. Just... Yeah, right on, right on, right on. So two coats of that. Um, for anybody who's worried about uh, SID or surface-induced discoloration, you can also put a layer of PVA size in there before the gessos, if you're worried about surface-induced discoloration, which uh, occurs from the lignin and the acids in, in the woods and the glues in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> but that's going to take... A long time. A long time. So... Uh, if your grandchildren have one of my paintings and they bitch about it, tough. Sure. You got to remember, ninety-nine percent of us aren't going to be famous or have paintings that are going to last a hundred years. So, as long as they bring you enjoyment and everyone else that buys them for their lifetime, I think you are good and responsible. Mm -hmm. And if you want to make any conservators of your paintings in the future very very happy you can write exactly what you used on the painting and what varnish you used um, in your painting process on the back of your painting and then if they ever do need to touch it up they'll know how to best do that so now i'm just this is more of a reminder for myself to get um, some horizontal motion in the water um, it all depends what you want to do with it it's your choice. Brush here. Now you can see here the water is quite, quite uh, light, which is the result of the photograph. Photographs usually make the brights too bright and the darks too dark. So a little bit of white, a little bit of um, cerulean blue hue. I'm using that recently because it has. I like. I like. Um, Cerulean, but it's too expensive. So I use the hue because it's cheaper and it actually has a little more chroma and more tinting strength. So here, this is just reminders for myself to put a little bit of reflection up here and there. It's a bit, a bit light. It's all about shapes, right? And it might be bigger than I want it, but it doesn't matter. I can always come back in later with the green and get a little bit um, variation. Right now for the fun part, uh, we're gonna move that yellow thing that's in central over here a little bit. So I gotta bring it down here. So I'll take some of that original green and I'll throw yellow into it. Cause yellow will lighten it, but we'll see if it's light enough. Probably not. No, it's good chroma, but the value is wrong. So it's all about value, right? Value first and then temperature. People worry about color too much. Here, I'm gonna actually bring it over farther. So here, a 
or yellow. All right, we have a bit of this water here. Okay. Take some of that dark green, put it in as the water back here. Might be a little bit too light. I'll darken it up a bit. We'll see where that takes us. I'm just darkening it up, not just for the photo, because the photograph is darker, but because it'll make good contrast with the people that are standing there when I put them in. Okay. So this is the sandbar and this is a bunch of ripply water or turbulent water, which I'll deal with in a second. The trees are quite vibrant, so I'll go put them with some yellow, kill them with some ochre, more altering blue, we'll do a test, get more vibrancy. And I usually have uh, two or three blues in my palette. So using ultramarine blue with the Hansi yellow produces a bit of, or a different green than a, say, a cobalt blue with the Hansi yellow. So we can get a good variety of, um, but this is the base. It's probably, it's too light. We'll start and somewhere. Michael, I should in this really vibrant layer of trees and light back there. Would you say that when painting reflections, the colors in the reflections tend to be muted and cooler? Uh, I'd say they're muted. Um, whether it'd be cooler, that's probably a possibility because they wouldn't probably wouldn't get warmer, would they? I'd say that's a that's a good that's a good statement to go by. Mm -hmm. I feel like the only way that the reflections would be warmer would be if it's like golden hour or the light is just very the quality of light in in the environment is very very warm at that time, and that's yeah. giving the water itself like a yellow paint. But I feel like if the water was getting yellow cast, so would everything around the water. Um, so yeah. Maybe yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. The more you paint, um, it doesn't help people that don't paint a lot, but the more you paint, the more you got a good grasp on this stuff and you can you pretty much do all that on the fly, which is nice. It's learning it in the beginning because it's all relative and it takes you a while for your head to get around that. And Michael, what size brush are you using right now? Uh, it's a worn out bristle signet nine so in reality that would have started off as about an inch wide but it's pretty beaten up okay fantastic so it was that a, a was it a flat it was yeah i okay. always prefer long it's flats flat, but it looks like a filbert yeah and it's about a size 12 okay i'll write that in the chat <laughs> And I'm using, a, usually I don't like using bristles, but I'm using bristles because it creates great lines when you uh, put it on the canvas or board in this case. We'll mute this, we'll cool it off to the right. And the reason I'm doing that is, you know, make this cool, this will look warmer. And as a reminder of myself, I'll just scratch in some lines. So a little bit of blue up there. Comes down. We'll lighten it a little. Kind of a reminder of whether it stays as bright, we'll see. Let's give a sense of rocks and whatnot. So I know this isn't reflections right now, but I got to get everything else in to be able to um, fully understand what's going on. So the water is going to be a little more blue. Okay. Okay, a little bit too dark.
Any other questions out there? Yeah, so we actually, we, we had folks asking whether they can see your palette and whether you'd be, I'd be able to identify the cool shades and the warm shades on it. But I think it might be good to wait till the end for that. What do you think? Okay, yeah, remind me of that. Just gonna darken this water up here a little bit. Bring some of this dark up here. Through these trees. So back into the reflections. So look good when it's all in white canvas, and but now it's um, quite light. So we're gonna go back in. It doesn't matter how long I painted for, I, I most of the time get it wrong than I do right. So we'll go back in and uh, we'll start making it darker. So the thing about color temperature is um, it only has a temperature in relative to something else. So, you know, globally blue is inherently cool, but you know, you take an ultramarine blue and you put it beside a cobalt blue and all of a sudden that blue is, um, is a warm blue. So, I don't know if you can really think the only time you can think about colors is cool or warm independently is just globally right red and yellows are warm and hot and blues are greens are cool but then you get like a sap green that's more warm but only if you compare it to a viridian mm -hmm. green or something like that right colors are so incredibly relative right so oh, it is it's 100 percent so right like if you're if you're thinking about whether a color is warm or cool and that is very important for painting reflections um a really good way to think of it is, okay, so sure, you're, you're picking a green, say it's a sap green. What I want you to do is think about the whole spectrum of greens that exist, everywhere from a very, very yellow toned green, which would be seen as a warmer green, to a very, very blue green, which would be seen as a cooler green. Oh, and the reason why I spotlight myself is because Michael just popped offline, so I'll re-spotlight Michael as soon as he's back. Um, but say, for example, if you're thinking about the whole spectrum of greens, you have yellow green on one end and you have um, blue green on the other. So warm and then cool and sap green does have a little bit more yellow in it. You can in your brain extrapolate that sap green is going to be somewhere over here on the more yellow and thus warmer side of the green spectrum. So I know that just applies to green, but that's a really good way um, to think about it. Okay, so this got a little bit too yellow on me. We got a really good question about Excellent. why you chose lilac in your sandbar. Oh, you mean violet? Or violet, yes. <laughs> um, second here, a little more orange. Awesome. Um, so. <laughs> I chose that because uh, just painting and stuff like that. I noticed there's a lot of violet in them. And in this instance, though, we have that guy wearing a yellow shirt, so the violet will go nice with the yellow shirt. Plus, it goes nice with the greens because they have yellow on them as well. But it's a dirty violet, right? It's not too vibrant. And I think one of the reasons why it's appearing so vibrant for you folks is, is actually a bit of an optical illusion from the yellows that are in the greens playing off of that violet. So that reminded me this is... Just putting another value in here, a little bit darker, to help it read a little bit better. Keep those edges soft. Oh, okay. space. We got a fantastic question from Francine. You folks are really coming up with awesome questions today. So um, Francine says his reflections are a variety of colors. Um, Michael, do you add from the palette without mixing to get that effect? Or do you mix on the palette to create these different colors first? Um, majority of the time I'm mixing on the palette, especially when I'm looking at shapes to put in to light. So for example, in this, this instance here, right? I know this shape in the uh, image over there. I'm just putting in that shape. Um, but a lot of the times if, let's say, yeah, let's say this needs a little, a little bit warmer, right? I will occasionally just pick up some of my orange and, and rub it in instead awesome. of mixing on the palette. 
So, so I do both. A more concentrated color, you can apply it by itself. This water back here needs another sense of depth. Oh, last time, just, just so that you do know what we were talking about last time, we were talking about um, whether you premix your palette or premix your colors on your palette when you're adding different colors into your reflection. And we left. Oh, yeah, that's right. Sometimes you do. And sometimes you're like, I think there needs to be orange right there. So I'm just going to take a little bit of orange and add it in. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It all depends on what you what you like to do as well. And I just noticed for whatever reason that my reflection is off. So I'll just do that in. Right, they gotta line up. So don't make that mistake. It's and funny what your eye misses until you stand back and view it, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I also have to mention um the reason why I'm so nonchalant about Michael dropping off the line occasionally just in case anyone is wondering is because Michael is an incredibly fast painter <laughs> as we learned last time so I'm like oh okay we lost a minute yeah that's that's fine like Michael the thing with Michael is he could paint this in like 15 minutes if we weren't asking him questions um so you guys will see this start to come to life and I, I appreciate is. you guys sticking around too like look at all this texture all right question do you ever tone your canvases or your services before you start working on them or do you always work um, yeah I, I used to um i've tried that workshops blah blah, blah. um but i but i miss to be able to you know the ability to do something like something like this you know you pull something away and you get that see how vibrant that is i can't paint that i don't know if it shows up on screen or not yeah i mean look at that so that's why i like leaving it white underneath because you can have that amazing reflection or the amazing transparency of the pigment on the white whereas if i tone it with a sienna i do that eh, can't do it um, that being said sometimes my canvases are toned just because i don't like a painting and then i wipe it off so next time i come back to that panel it still has res residue on it and and that's worked for me in the past it's kind of sometimes it's beneficial i find it's more beneficial when the residual is um is a, a warm tone rather than a cool tone um, so you can see the reflection coming along already. I've switched over to a synthetic brush because I get to a point where I need to paint over wet paint. And I have to start making some decisions because if I leave this reflection this big, if we were to paint this guy in now, let's just get some yellow as a reference here. And we're going to put him in put him more over here. Let's say he ends up there. That gets a bit overpowering probably because of these strokes here. So if I were to dull that down. He would start to come out a little bit more. And he isn't in the final position, of course, because that's just, I just wanted to see how it competes with everything else. Put a violet in here. Let's play with the sky and the water. Just going to push this value down here a little bit darker. Again, what it does is it helps that whole process of gradation. Dark to light, get rid of some of these white marks. Right. What we could do just for shits and giggles is we could warm up this side of the blue. So this is a cooler blue, this is a warmer blue. So it creates a double gradation and creates a little more interest in this bottom section of water. I just warmed it up by adding a little bit of yellow. There we go. And what I can do is I can lighten it. To progress up. Whoops. Mix and test, mix and test. That's pretty much how my paintings go. This is a, this is a cool question. So Dorothy asks, um, when re when painting the reflections of clouds in water, have you noticed whether these clouds tend to translate warmer or cooler? Um, no, I haven't. I feel like that would be somewhat dependent on the lighting conditions as well. And like That's how bright the light on the water and also what temperature the light on the water is. 
that being said, someone on the internet might have cracked that code. So I do highly recommend um, doing some searching and seeing what you come up with. Otherwise, it might just be kind of like a, okay, take the pocket color wheel out of the pocket, check to see what color the clouds are, what value, et cetera. Trying to create some interest in there, then we can start getting to the. How are we for time, by the way? You have 11 minutes. Oh, jeepers, creepers, eh? So let's <laughs> get to the reflection and we'll ignore the rest. Um, now we have the pockets of light. And it's just determining where these are going to go in terms of, right? You don't have to be exact. You can see all the little dimpling throughout. Some go across. Some are just sections within it. This is the brightest on the um, picture. I don't know if I want it the brightest on the painting though. See how it just steps up like that. Smaller, bigger, variety. One goes across here. And it's just observing. I mean, there's a lot of dibs and dabs but it's determining which dibs and dabs are going to be the most beneficial. How would you screw that up? Too late. Comes up quite a bit. These are equal, which I don't like. In the photograph, the middle one's higher, which I like. So we'll kind of bring that up. A little bit of lightness in here that I missed. So I'm just painting shapes right now. I don't even know what this looks like. So I'm going to step back and have a look, clear my eyes. Okay, yeah, it's starting to come, starting to come across as something that's reflecting a lot of stuff. There's more so in here. Got some nice little reflections going on. You know, you don't have to stick with all vertical, sometimes they come on an angle or horizontal, I mean. Sometimes they touch, sometimes they don't. And you know, this is a number two flat. I'll get a, I'll get a, a rigger brush soon enough. And um, I gotta kill this value a little bit here. Something like that. Start getting that out. Because I forgot I wanted that one higher. Maybe something off the board. I have a bit back here. You could argue if this is too light or not. I don't know. I only got 11 minutes, so I don't really have a choice. It gives you a little, little something in that in that area to help create interest. A little more yellow in that little pond area there to help continue that down, cool that or delve that down a bit, delve that down a bit. And then we'll get the magic rigger brush out, which is just a long round um, oil painting brushes. Usually you find these in the uh, watercolor area. So my, is, yeah. It's asking how it seems that um, you're able to paint two colors on your brush when you're painting. Do you think that that has to do with there being oil paint of different colors just on your brush? Or do you think that it's uh, the paint that you're applying blending with the oil paint underneath it? Yeah, it's uh, it's all of those, plus the fact that I don't mix my paint very well. <laughs> it's it's not go. homogenous. And that, that helps quite a bit because uh, it gets, unless you're painting graphically with something very, very flat, you know, like uh, some of the, can't remember the British guy who does that, but a lot of people do it. Um, you mix it really well, but for stuff like reflections and trees, I don't bother mixing it very well at all. Awesome That's thing. Trees in the background here. What you could do if you want, you could mimic this, um, but they don't really show in the photograph, but you could have some fun and just 
see if those work, soften the edges a bit. Or just put a straight line here and there. Gives, gives a sense of variety. Uh, one thing though, that you don't see in this photo is the water against the rocks. As it moves, it, um, it shimmers, right? Where it laps up against the rocks. You can't really see it very well. Um, but generally it kind of just hits in certain areas. So I'll just use a light blue here for the sky reflecting on it. And um, you can kind of see it on the, the image. Could be a little bit darker. You gotta remember this is the water reflection in shadow. And you could, well, maybe not down below. I'm gonna make it a little bit lighter. And then you can put a little bit area in here and there where it might be. So what I like about the ringer brush is it creates smaller lines, of course. Um, so you can start doing kind of a, some some wigglies. If you're an oil painter and you're trying to paint wigglies over the paint that you have, you got to thin down your your mixture. So it's quite loose. And just go in and back and forth randomly here and there where it makes sense. Maybe just do a dib and dab. Here and there. The random dot. Go more across. Maybe we have one coming off the edge here. And what I like to do, although you don't really see it, is I like pink or light red within water. I like all color. As long as color doesn't matter as long as it's the right value. So let's see here. So this pink has a nice little something to this water, just don't use a lot of it. Because then it gets overwhelming and it's not really an accent color anymore. We could do the same for an orange. Too light. Some of those together. Put a highlight there. So it's amazing what one little or two little dabs go, how they work so well together. This guy, put him in, then he needs some legs. So there's no way you should spend any amount of time that's significant on these figures. Put in his head. There we go. Maybe the other person is more blue. I don't know. Let's see. Well, she's more black, but definitely too light. Get the idea. I'd have to figure how to finesse with these a little bit. Back to the water. We're going to throw in some logs. Mix some of this in. A little bit of violet. Logs in BC area I find are quite violet. I don't know why. Violet and um, yellow ochre is a great mixture. Put some, put some logs in through here. Remember the dark first. Things that need a lot of uh, interest, three values, things that don't really need a lot of interest, but are just indicative of being there. I uh, can usually get away with two values. So there's logs in a darker value and I'll put the logs in a lighter value. Over top. Probably need a little more blue in it though. There's a sky reflection.
And Michael, when you're painting, do you ever scrape into your paint? Uh, yeah, I do occasionally. Sometimes if um, I'm painting a large field of something, um, I like laying in the field and I like scraping it off because the texture of the, um, the board really helps. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, it might actually help here. Oh, there's hardly any texture on this board, unfortunately, but good way to get some reflection interest. Mm -hmm. Right. But then you got instances where that happens and you got to fix it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a real back and forth. Always try to do variety no matter what. Even just taking paint off, right? Like you got one of these beautiful rubbery thingies, right? Mm hmm. Um, especially if you're working on white. Let's see what happens though is it becomes too white. <laughs> yeah, that's a very that's a that is a very white value right there. Yeah, so we'd have to kill it and and move it. So the squigglies again. Sometimes you want big, sometimes you want small. Maybe there's a big squiggly here. Michael, people are asking about why you tend to fold your brush at the very end. Uh, because the less control helps for more interest. Um, you see this line here, it's, it's fat, thin, wiggly up, down. It just creates a lot more um, variety, I guess you could say. Um, and it helps me be, be looser. So if, you, if you're a tight painter and you want to be looser, hold your brush at the very end. And I've actually made, um, I made these a while ago. These are big sticks. I put my brush in them and I stand back, whatever that is, three feet. And that's how I became a little more looser than I used to be. I used to paint real high realism and stuff, but that gets old quick if you've done it a, a, for any amount of time. Mm -hmm. And folks, it has reached 1230. So if anybody does have prior commitments that they need to attend to and they need to jump off and get to those, no hard feelings on our end. It seems like Michael's very much in the zone. So I think we get a few more minutes of painting from him. Um, let's see. Yeah, a little warmer. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll swing my camera down here. So just go over my colors. Uh, this is a violet I mix um, of ultramarine blue and uh, Elysian crimson. I just like mixing my own violet because I control it. This is the transparent orange, which I really love. Viridian, Viridian transparent orange is great for moss. Um, yellow ochre, fantastic in BC for the fall and the late spring, or early spring. Hats yellow medium, my, my preferred yellow. This is CAD yellow medium, um, which I haven't touched in forever. Uh, CAD red light or medium, which I haven't touched forever. I just kind of don't use these anymore, but they stay on my palette because that looks like a lot, costs a lot of money. <laughs> Um, this is a permanent alizarin crimson. Uh, an alternative to that is like a uh, pigment with a PR-177, I believe. This is a cerulean blue hue. This is cobalt blue, altering blue. Uh, these two blues are previous mixes from whatever I was painting before. Sometimes I say paint. And this is a transparent red earth uh, clo close to um, burnt sienna. And then I put a long string of white down the side because I keep on dipping into it. And so that's my, that's my palette. I've never seen a white like tube before. Yeah, it's always nice because as you eat out, eat away at it, right? You're always, you always have fresh white. You're never that's mixing in scary. to a big pile. Yeah. And we have a question about what white you prefer earlier. Is it titanium? Yeah, titanium. I, I used to use a little bit of um, zinc white. But there are a lot of articles and a lot of instances about people mm -hmm. having trouble with it cracking. Yeah, zinc white, when used by itself, is a very soft, crumbly paint over time. So if you are using zinc white, it is recommended to use it as a mixing white and not by itself. Yeah. So any other questions? Yeah. 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 Let's see. Okay. So Jill says Michael mentioned that he uses. Um, that he's now using a synthetic brush. When do you tend to switch from a bristle brush to a synthetic brush during your painting process? Uh, usually after the initial block in. Um, I like throwing in using bristle brushes for the very beginning. <laughs> Excuse me. Because it, it provides all this stuff you'd never be able to paint, all this sense of variety, all these strokes that, you know, let me zoom in a little bit. 
Wow. Right. You can see all this stuff here, right? How am I going to paint that? And so the beauty of a bristle brush is it scrapes the paint away as well as it put down. So you get that great sense of variety there. And then when I want to paint on top of that, that is when I bring out the uh, synthetics. Because if you uh, look here, you can see how easier it is to put the paint on top without it actually coming off again, right? Totally. Would you add details to the rocks? And if yes or no, why? And also, if you were going to add details, how would you? Uh, well, I can skirt half that question anyway. Um, no, I'd, I'd, I wouldn't add any detail whatsoever. The most I would do is um, uh, just change the value a little bit here and there um, in terms of where I can see it. Uh, so up here in this photograph here, you can sort of see a, a, a shadow there. Right. At most, maybe I go in there and I put that shadow in, although it actually has a little bit of green going in there. But I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily go in and show detail. It's too far away. Like if I had a rock up here, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely put the rock in. But um, in terms of uh, adding detail to these rocks, no, never. Because it's not about the rocks, is it? Kind of my attitude. If my intention for you is not to focus on it, then I'm not going to paint on paint it. And that makes it easier on me as an artist. Your palette is glass, right? Uh, yeah, it's back painted with a little bit of uh, neutral gray, number five, mi that I make mixed up myself. Oh, and how do you dispose of your like oil rags or paper towels? Uh, I bought a uh, uh, one of those tin metal garbage cans from Canadian Tire. It's outside next to my house, not around anything. Mm -hmm. um so basically what i do is i you know i crump up my all my paper towel that i use for the time being i take my glove i wrap my glove around it mm -hmm. and then i go outside and i dump it in there just in case i've never mm -hmm. had a fire there but mm -hmm. you never know right that's uh, right after they sit there for six months to a year depending on how long it takes me to fill it then i'll just dump it in the garbage oh and michael do you ever add details in the trees since you know we didn't add details into the rocks mm -hmm. Michael, will you do the trees yeah yeah i'll, I'll go in and i'll um change the value. Maybe I'll put a lighter tree here. You can see the a dark tree in the far right in the photograph. I'll probably put one in there. Uh, it'll just be here and there. Another another way to do it, though, is uh, I know the short answer is yes, but this is kind of a longer answer as well, is um, I have this mass of green here. I wouldn't necessarily put the, put the trees in, but what I do is I'd start putting some sky holes in, and then that sort of is indicative of where where some branches go, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So that you can do it that way. You don't have to necessarily put the trunks in themselves. The sky holes will help considerably. So yeah, this this area is definitely unfinished. Um, it just needs to be worked over some more. We also got a question about whether you would be willing to send a picture of your reference image and also this painting to me so that we can send them out. To folks. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll Yay. do that today for you. That would be awesome. And we also, uh, Lynette asked, and I think a few other people asked too, will you be posting um, this painting to either your Instagram or your Facebook? Uh, in its current state, no. <laughs> um, there's a thing that every artist should do and it's self-curating. Fair and enough. If, if something's not at a specific point, then you won't post it. However, say that, I'll probably work on this for another hour today, get it to a better looking state, and then uh, I'll, then I'll send it off and post it. Oh, that's fantastic. So actually, with that in mind, would you be willing to take a picture of it now and at the end? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. That's a good idea. Awesome. Because then you guys can see how it progressed. I think that would be really wonderful. For yeah, good idea. So thank you, Michael. Another amazing demo complete with us. Thanks fantastic. for having me and thank you for everyone who attended.